In this episode, we're going to take a look at a really useful tool that's available from the OWASP organization called WebScarab. WebScarab is a web application proxy tool that can be used to intercept requests, make changes to them, do session analysis, validate input, all kinds of different things. And while there are a variety of different tools that are in the same category as this particular tool, for instance, Burp Intruder and Paros Proxy, I personally prefer this tool for much of the testing because even though this tool can be a little rough around the edges sometimes, it turns out that it's got some very, very powerful features that are extremely easy to use. Let's talk about one or two of them in today's session. Now, you can get a version of uh, OWASP, of the uh, WebScarab tool, right from the OWASP site. You'll find that there is a download link for the different versions that you may have. I would recommend that rather than download the installable version that you can find out on SourceForge, that instead you try to find a daily build. Now, the daily build you find may be a little bit on the older side, but I can promise you that the daily build will definitely contain more features than the most recent uh, installable version that you have out there. So once you've downloaded the tool, how do you use it? Well, this particular tool is a Java-based tool. So that means that as long as you have a system with a Java virtual machine, you can run this tool. Let me get mine started. Now, you will find when you run this particular tool that even though it's written in Java and it works the same way, some of the display will be a little bit different. For example, I'm running mine here on a Macintosh, and you'll see that here at the top, rather than seeing file tabs, I see actual buttons. Most versions, most uh, operating systems, virtual machines, will actually show you file tabs. So there may be small quirks in how it displays, but otherwise the tool works the same way. One other quick item is that if you go to try out what I'm demonstrating here, you may find that when you first run Web Scarab, you don't see all of the different options that I do. Don't worry, you haven't done anything wrong. It turns out that the developers of Web Scarab, for some reason, decided to distribute the tool with the light interface turned on. Now to change this, simply pull down the tools menu that you find at the top and change it to use full featured interface. Once you do that, it will require that you exit out and then restart Web Scarab, and then you'll have this full interface again. And just to save you a little bit of time, when you go to exit out of Web Scarab to make that change, do not use the red X up over here on a Mac or the red X up over here on a Windows machine. Instead, you must use the file exit command. If you don't, it's not going to save the preferences. Well, now that I have it up and running, how do I actually use it? This tool is actually a man-in-the-middle proxy or a web application proxy testing tool. If I go into proxy and then into the listeners, you'll find that it by default will start up a listener on port 8008 of the localhost machine. So the first thing we need to do is make sure that our web, uh, web browser is also using that same proxy. So to make that change, I've chosen to use in this uh, this example Firefox so that it'll uh, work the same pretty much everywhere you go. But I've also chosen to do it because I've found that sometimes Safari can be a little bit finicky when it comes to using proxies. So I simply use Firefox for my testing to make things a little bit more standard. So I'll make that quick change there, changing my network settings to use that proxy. And then perhaps I'll just reload this page and it tells me that the connection is untrusted. Now, why is it saying this? Well, if you notice up here, HTTPS is in use. We're trying to use SSL. However, it's telling me that there's a problem. If I open this up, it tells me that this is not trusted because it's a self-signed certificate and it's coming out of Web Scarab. Well, that's actually a really good thing. Not only is Firefox trying to protect me, but it also shows me that by making that proxy change, now my request is being proxied through Web Scarab, and, and that in, will mean for me that now I could perhaps add an exception for this, if that were the site I were going to check. Let me get that certificate, wrong site, that's fine. I'm going to confirm the exception. I won't store it permanently. But now I'm able to pull up that OWASP site, and if I switch back over here to the summary, notice that now there are many different requests that show up here in the summary page. It'll keep track of every request that goes by, 
And we always have the opportunity to, for instance, right click and show a conversation so that we can go back and look and see what's actually happened in the past and view these pages in a variety of different ways. Though personally, I prefer to look at things using the raw view because this shows you the actual HTTP request that was made and then of course the responses that were coming back. Now, if you're not very familiar with how HTTP works and you're beginning to look here and say, well, I don't know if this episode is for me, just bear with me for a few more minutes because it turns out that some of the most powerful features of this tool can be used without having a deep understanding of how the underlying protocols work. So let me close this window up and get on with what I actually want to talk to you about, how we can use the fuzzer portion, portion of this tool to automatically validate some of the input validation that we may find in a web application. Here I've switched over to the fuzzer tab and you'll notice that within the tab I can build manually any web request I'd like to. I can add in headers, I can add in perform parameters, but this is not a pleasant way to work with a form. There's a much easier way to approach this problem. To do it, I'm going to switch back over to the summary view, and I can see that I'm currently up at around request number 26. That was the pull out for the OWASP page. Let me go to a, an internal website that I have here, and I'm going to pull up a, pull up a management page we have for some of our, tweet, uh, our uh, Twitter information. And I'm going to go into the tweets, and I'd like to edit a tweet. So let me click on edit. And what my goal is, is to validate that this form works correctly. So all I'll do is maybe just make a little change here so that something's actually changed until to update the tweet. Now, I've done all of this using the web browser and not have to, not had to look at the Web Scarab interface again yet, but now we're going to switch back over there to Web Scarab. And in the Web Scarab interface, let's see what's happened. I can see a whole lot of GET requests, but the one I'm really looking for is this POST request here. Why a POST request? Well, best practice is that if you're going to accept input into your application, all of that input should be sent using a POST request. Why that is, I'm not going to get into in this episode, but that is best practice. Once I've found that request, I could even verify that that is the one I want simply by viewing the conversation. And when I do that, I can see here that, while well, yes, in fact, here are the parameters that were sent in that particular request. I can see, for instance, the title of that tweet, five queries every IT auditor should use in a Windows domain. This actually is where we're storing that, that, uh, that form. Well, once I found that request, that post, I can simply right click and tell it to use it as a fuzzing template. Now when I use it as a fuzzing template, it will automatically populate this interface here, showing me all of the different parameters that were set by this particular application. Now, to do my validation, this becomes very, very easy. All I need to do to see whether or not this application has any problems when it comes to input is to now manipulate these fields. It, you could do this manually, but it's actually a lot of work and can take a very long time. How does it work? Well, let me start by taking a look at a file that I've created called all attack. The all attack file that I have here simply contains a lot of different strings that I've found can be useful in testing web applications. For instance, different applications I've found will respond in bad ways when some of these requests are sent. For instance, this one here. Some web applications are not smart enough to see that this is actually an attempt to do a directory traversal. So in order to bypass the web application filtering that's built in, we'll send all of these different requests and see if any of them do anything bad to this particular web application. As you find things that do bad things, you simply add them into a file that you maintain so that you can automatically do regression testing as an application is improved. How do I use that kind of file though? Well, let's go to the Sources tab. When I pull up the sources, I can now browse for a file and the file I'm looking for is, let me just get to it here, is going to be found out on my desktop called All Attack. And then I'm going to simply give it description, a description. The actual description doesn't matter too much, but you have to give it a description. 
If you don't give it a description, you're going to get a null pointer exception out of the Java interface. So that's not so pleasant. But once I've added it in and I click on my file of attacks here, I can see all of the different strings that are contained in that file that will be used for the testing. You could actually add as many sources as you'd like to. I personally usually will keep all of my different strings right in one file. Let me close that up. And now that I have that source set up, I can now choose which portions of the application I'd like to manipulate. And I'd like to manipulate, for instance, this one here, the title. So let me change that to use my file of attacks. And you'll see that when I make that change, there's another change that happens here. The total number of requests required is now changed to 367. Let me make some other changes here. There's an expiration field that's made up of a date. Let me make some changes to that. I'm just, I'm just going to use this same file for all of the different pieces of that. And now we have a tweet count. Sure, we can change that too. And then, well, this looks like the button that's used to update the tweet. So I'm not going to change that. I'm also not going to change the authenticity token. That's used to see if there's forgery involved. I'm not going to change the session variable because if I did that, it would log out my session. Though at some point I will need to test those values as well. For right now, I really only want to test out the pieces of the form that the user is changing. Now, notice that the total requests here to make this happen is currently set at 367. Now, it was at that when I set this up for the first query. But I really want to see if it's the combination of the different strings that make this happen. So in order to make that change, Notice here that we have a field called Priority. Priority is probably not the best name, though it is hard to come up with a good name for this. A better way to think of this is maybe combinations. For instance, it may not be that putting a, a number one in all of the fields creates a problem, but maybe having true in one field, one in another field, a big number in another field, and, and some combination is what actually creates a problem. So when I change this to one or change the the sequence that things will happen and notice that the number of total requests has dramatically changed. And let's change this one to two. So we could put these on the same sequence or we can change them to as many sequences as we want. And oh, but I may not want to go that far. I should actually be fine, but the display here, notice is using a, an assigned integer, though I have an unsigned value that's being displayed now. Well, once that's set up, I can simply click on the Start button, and off it goes. Now, notice that I've already got a problem. I'm seeing an internal server error come back on all of these different requests. So I'm going to actually stop this right now. The internal server error tells me that there is a significant problem on this particular application. And what's happening here is we're coming back with, we're sorry, something went wrong with a 500 error. A 500 error typically means that your web application has crashed. So this is very, very serious. If I were doing a validation of this particular application, I don't actually need to make sure that I can break into the application. In fact, if I'm validating its security, hopefully I cannot break in. But if I run a fuzzer and I'm seeing 500 internal server error, that's very serious. Now, in this particular case, I know the cause. For this particular application, what's happening is the authenticity token is not going to match correctly because it actually distributes a different uh, authenticity token for each page. And if that's not valid, it's not going to accept the request. However, even with that, even with that knowledge, to send back an error page like this, a 500 internal server error, that should never happen in a public web application. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this episode. In our next episode, we're going to take a look at some more of the features that we have here in WebScarab, particularly how I can use both the fuzzer and the search tool to make this a little bit easier when I start looking at millions of requests that need to be made. If you have questions, as always, feel free to contact me. And if you have suggestions for episodes, please feel free to send them to me on Twitter or by email or perhaps even through LinkedIn.